from uh, Boston, uh, Boston University. Augustine will be speaking about the Share Compute Cluster here on campus. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Augustine Abaris. I'm a systems programmer at Boston University. I'm here to give you a presentation that's more or less a show and tell. Um, just wanted to share with you guys uh, um, what we've built using CentOS. Um, so uh, SCC cluster, as we call it, is an HPC resource um, built and operated by ISNT at Boston University uh, by Research Computing Services Group, which I'm a part of. Uh, this cluster was built with the value for the researcher in mind. Um, that is the uh, sort of underlying principle for most of our design decisions, be it purchase of hardware, software, or how we spend our time. Um, the cluster supports shared and bind service models, and what that means is there's a portion of a cluster that is purchased by the university um, that is available to all the researchers at the university free of charge. Um, there is also an option for the researchers to buy resources uh, on their own grant money. Uh, they have benefit of integrated infrastructure, support by us, um, and they also have priority access to the resources that they purchase. Uh, there's also a benefit to the university because people that did not buy in can use some of those cycles uh, when the resources are idle. Um, in other computing sites, uh, this is sometimes known as the condom model. Uh, so hardware to this cluster has been added over many years. It wasn't built all at once. We usually add hardware a couple of times a year. Um, before we get into the details, a uh, couple of minutes to talk about HPC, just so uh, many of you may already know this, but just to put it in the context of what we're working with. So HPC is generally a practice of aggregating compute power, scaling it out of individual workstation, and sending it off to many systems in order to solve large problems. Uh, you need to split up a problem in a way that can utilize that kind of power, and so we just want to quickly look at oversimplified what a scientific workflow looks like. This is very oversimplified, but workloads either serial or parallel. Um, looking at more detail, serial is very simple. Just divide the problem up into small pieces, run them independently. They can run on different computers, different speed, different processors. They don't have to be in order. Uh, if uh, your problem can be solved in such a way, then uh, that's great because you'll be spending more time working on your research rather than learning computer architectures and paying for high-end hardware. Um, parallel processing uh, is more complicated but re is required to effectively cer uh, so solve certain types of problems and that involves parallelizing tasks in order to do computation effectively. Um, sometimes the number of tasks exceeds the number of cores available in a single piece of hardware. So we use high-speed interconnects to aggregate that compute power. When uh, you're solving problems parallel, you need to share the memory between the threads and you need to synchronize them. And that's where high-speed interconnects come into play. We use a technology called InfiniBand to do so. Uh, there's also, there have been technologies in the past that are no longer around to, to accomplish the same goal. There's a new technology from Intel called OmniPath um, that's sort of all comparable. In our case, we use InfiniBand. Um, so just a little bit about HPC. Uh, this is not quite what we do, but on the very high end of it, uh, you have top 500 systems. Those are large parallel systems. Um, they are often built to solve a specific class of problems, whether it's life sciences or physics um, or cryptography. Um, they're all listed in top 500 websites. They are ranked by running a benchmark called LINPAC, and uh, they measured by floating point operations per second. The largest system right now is at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab called the Summit. Um, IBM Power 9 CPUs, 2 million cores. Um, we're nowhere near that. So, <laughs> um, the trends, uh, this is uh, on logarithmic scale. Still upwardly slope, I think speaks for itself. Um, noteworthy uh, that Linux has been dominating top 500. Um, so almost all of them are running Linux these days. 
And so back to SCC cluster. Yes, we're nowhere nearly as big, 16,000 cores. Um, we're not a massively parallel system. Uh, some of the top 500 systems, um, they have InfiniBand high-speed interconnect going to every node. So when they benchmark them using Linpack, they run on thousands or in some cases millions of cores in parallel and they get a very nice number. We don't. Um, why not? Well, that's um, not what our researchers need. Uh, uh, they need parallel capability and it's very important to provide that, but um, uh, we have a huge demand of serial workloads, and so the makeup of a cluster reflects that. Uh, we also have heterogeneous hardware, because it's been built on many years. You have different generations of processors. You can't really run parallel workloads around, across those. Um, so we also support 700 different applications, which often have very conflicting requirements. So. It's not a massively parallel system, but we can still do quite a bit with it. And even though our largest job is only 448 cores, if you're doing 256 core or 128 core jobs, then uh, there's plenty of capacity to get your work done. Um, so uh, who is this for? We have over 2,000 users, 80 departments, um, sometimes uh, the classrooms, use SCC as a teaching tool. Now, this cluster is hosted at MGHPCC in Holyoke. That is a uh, Massachusetts Green High Performance Compute Center. It is built by consor consortium of universities, uh, Harvard, Northeastern, UMass, MIT, and BU. It's also hosting several collaborative efforts that are um, across those universities with several institutions involved. Uh, it's a great facility. Uh, the cluster I'm talking about could not be hosted at Boston University. There is no uh, space, and uh, by which I mean maybe physical space, but certainly no power and absolutely no way of cooling it. We would not have been able to build the system of that scale on campus, but out in Western Mass, electricity cheap. Um, the building is brand new, designed to do so. So we're able to build a system of that size and it actually hosts a couple of systems even larger than that. Um, so who are our clients again? Uh, this is an animated graph. I apologize I don't have the years, but this is a annual year-to-year -year time sequence. It represents different colleges that we serve. Um, the bars sticking out of it represents the compute hours. Uh, it's again on a logarithmic scale. And um, over the years, the usage has um, ramped up. Uh, we are, every year, we have more and more people taking advantage of this resource. So um, very simple diagram. We have gateway nodes, which involve login nodes that support SSH and VNC sessions, and uh, recently X2Go. Um, we have a data transfer node, so if a researcher has data set at NIH or some other institution, some other university, they can take advantage of Globus Connect software, Aspera uh, tools, or uh, just regular FTP. They can transfer their data in and out efficiently using transfer node. Virtual GL uh, allows researcher to uh, visualize their data. Um, in a VNC session, it's a remote desktop, but it has a graphics acceleration capability. So if you want to look at some of the data stored in our four petabyte file system, you can do so without having to download it. Uh, 20 compute racks, there's no real way of drawing it here, so um, we'll go into that next. Um, we have 20 racks of compute, 750 hosts, because it's been built over many years. 17 distinct CPU types. I'm not sure quite how that happened, but basically six generations of Intel processors with some minor variations based on what the needs are. Uh, 192 InfiniBand hosts. They're not all interconnected. They're small pockets of InfiniBand. Um, it's just um, based on the usage and demands. That's what was practical to build. Again, can do a massively parallel job, but if you have 256 core problem, there are run slots available. 
305 GPUs. That technology is changing very fast. We've been adding small increments because year to year, it's just it's evolving so fast that uh, if you have a GPUs that uh, that's that are three year old, no one's going to be interested in them. Uh, so our building blocks, we use uh, uh, densest form factor that is practical. Uh, in 2U, we have four servers. Uh, there are, these days, we outfit them with 10 gig Ethernet connection to the private network to get to the data, two sockets, two CPUs. Uh, right now, it's 192 gigs of RAM. That changes based on the CPU architecture. So in order to have efficient memory bandwidth, uh, we may add or remove some of the memory capacity. Uh, because if you don't fill out the server with the memory the right way, you're not going to get the right speed um, or best speed. So um, what doesn't fit in the form factor are GPU nodes and large memory nodes. Uh, we have a couple of unique scenarios there. Um, and then we build interconnects uh, that I keep mentioning using infinity band switches. We use 36 port switches as our, as our building block. We have several generations of this technology. The latest is EDR InfiniBand, which is 100 gigabits a second to a host. Uh, we typically connect things with 48 gig port 10 gig switches, um, 40 gigs uplinks out of that switch to the core to your data. Uh, so if we populate the rack, we have 44U to work with, some patch panel infrastructure, two sources of power, 30 amp, three phase, 230 volt, um, we, because of the density, we usually use two sets of switches, uh, 48 port 10 gig, and also a very low end uh, out of band management switch. Uh, servers are 100 miles away from here, so we do out of band management for everything. And so that's our building block, and we populate a rack with two of them, and we throw in a 36 bit uh, port infinite band switch but only one of them per rack because, first of all, we don't have enough space in the rack to fit it, and second of all, if we put a second one in, we might have some power issues. Uh, speaking of power, this is an extreme example of uh, what we configure. Um, many of our racks are not filled because there are, this is at the limit of what can be safely delivered to a single rack power-wise. But uh, we have racks that pull 20 kilowatts, average to 15. Uh, you get 72 computers, 2,000 cores, 80 gig ag aggregate of bandwidth to your data. Um, that's the densest thing. Uh, we have several of those. And then um, when we have GPUs, high memory, other nodes, we tend to space them out a little bit so there's breathing room and because uh, we actually have, uh, at the moment, there's uh, sp space. Uh, CentOS. 100% on every system that makes up this cluster. Uh, version 6 is production. We are working very hard on deploying version 7. Um, researchers that need version 7 right now, we have nodes. We can make more available. Um, we don't want to change the whole cluster to CentOS 7 right now because it will disrupt people's work. People have compiled and optimized the code. If we just change it to CentOS 7 right now, uh, we will uh, have to help a lot of folks to get themselves back up and running, but we don't want to get in people's way either, so um, CentOS 7 is there. Uh, the only proprietary drivers we use in the whole cluster are NVIDIA and GPFS. GPFS because we need it for our storage, and we only run that on the file servers, not on compute nodes. Compute nodes just use NFS protocol. NVIDIA, well, we need to install them because um, People want to do GPU work. That's the latest and greatest. Um, we use Open Grid Scheduler to schedule these jobs. And uh, so uh, that's formerly Sun product. Sun released it, um, released the source code, gave it away for free. Oracle picked it up, turned it into commercial. But during that time, the project split. We used the uh, open source version of Grid Scheduler. And so um, that interesting characteristics of that is that in the past, many batch systems had queues and uh, researchers had to understand the structure of those queues in order to work efficiently. Um, it's not unique to grid scheduler, but more modern technologies 
allow for a researcher to simply ask for resources and have the scheduler figure out what they want. We have 50 requestable resource types, but not to worry, nobody has to know. I think only people administering the system need to know all 50 of them. Most people don't ask for any, well, actually that's not true. You can just not even ask for anything and you will get one core in 12 hours, but as your workload gets more complicated, you can ask for more time, more memory, more cores, a software license if you need it. So I would like to think that majority of researchers using the cluster will ask for three or four parameters, even in the complicated cases, and they're good to go. Um, so a uh, very sober simplified diagram of how this works. Um, researchers are submitting jobs on the login node, goes to the badge daemon, which receives the request, consults the scheduler, scheduler knows about resources available and the utilization of those resources, uh, allocates the nodes, and then tells the badge daemon to dispatch it. And in this example, you have 64 core node, scheduler determined that it needs infinity band um, and allocates appropriate nodes to that job, and another person was running uh, single core jobs, they get allocated to a node that has sufficient resources. They may have more resources, the node, node might be running another job. Um, what you don't see in this diagram is um, thousands of jobs queued waiting to be scheduled, uh, uh, waiting for the resources to free up. But uh, that's a, just a very simple how a batch system works. So. Uh, moving on to storage, uh, 700 cl uh, compute clients uh, have uh, significant I.O. demands. Uh, we use IBM GPFS. Um, that's worked very well for us. Uh, we do share, uh, that's, we just use that to create the file system. We don't actually serve it up to clients. We use NFS uh, and that's worked very well for us. Um, notable features are user accessible snapshots. So if somebody wants to look, look and see of what their data looked like the day or two ago, they can do so anytime they want without needing to ask us to do so. Uh, quotas uh, for users and projects, pretty standard, but this allows us to allocate the resources fairly. Um, this is what the hardware looks like. Um, the overlay here sort of represents the layers of storage of what each piece of hardware provides. So you have seven storage arrays. Uh, we use SSDs in a limited way to speed up metadata and small file operations. Um, we have over a thousand disks. Uh, all of this is on fiber channel. Two fiber channel switches provide um, highly available connectivity. Um, file servers, every single file server can see every single disk in the system. Uh, they put those block devices into a file systems using NFS, uh, sorry, excuse me, using GPFS, and then they serve that up to compute nodes using NFS. Um, so what can this pile of hardware do? I know I kind of handpicked this particular graph because sometimes there's idle time, sometimes there's busy time. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like when everything's working well. Um, so you will see that uh, this is uh, bytes with a capital B, and the system is pushing uh, four gig uh, gigabytes uh, in and out. That's total, that's uh, reads and writes. Um, and it can burst to eight, and if I really searched for something ideal, I probably could find where it goes a little bit beyond that, but Maybe that's good enough. Um, so challenges with this type of storage, um, NFS performance needs to be monitored. Um, various workloads can knock it out and bring the whole thing to a crawl. So we found the most helpful way to take care of that is to monitor the call latencies. If we notice that NFS call latency goes up, you know, and when there's a real problem, it can be um, seconds, uh, then we investigate. We identify the workload that is causing it. Um, we either tune the system to address that or contact the person responsible for this workload and offer them help because 
if this is how the system is performing, the person who has that workload is not getting their work done either, and they usually find themselves very pleasantly surprised and happy because their jobs will start working much better after some work. Um, growing capacity of disk drives, well, I think that's a problem for everyone. Um, you will, and if you have a thousand disks, you will see almost any, every kind of failure, including a double disk failure. You will just see errors on the disk that has data written on it sitting there. So we do background scans and um, combining the features of both the arrays that we use and GPFS, if there is an error, uh, we can point it to a specific file, contact the person who owns that file and say, we're really sorry. Um, please check your data. We'd rather that you knew of a problem than didn't. And uh, it's only happened a couple of times, but we'd like to think that it's better to actually catch that. So um, also we switched to dynamic disk pooling, which is a property of modern storage arrays, which instead of RAID 6 distribute, it performs a similar type of data protection, but it distributes the blocks over all the disks in the array, so when you have a failure, every single disk in the array will participate in a rebuild and it'll get you back to where you're supposed to be, uh, the data uh, back to original level of protection uh, in a matter of a few hours, not in a matter of a few days. Um, now onto software, environment modules. Um, we, our application team provides over 700 software packages. Uh, this is uh, researchers request something, we compile it, we optimize it, we make it available, and then when people work with them, they need to maintain certain versions for a long time, and somebody else will need a newer version um, to do their work, and we have to manage those conflicts. So environment modules we've been using for a very long time. I know it's made it into Fedora, and I believe it's now in Epal, um, and that really made this possible. Uh, it I think it's great for researchers, for people using the cluster. Uh, we serve all, all our software over NFS. We split it out as we roll out new different operating systems. So um, container technology, we've recently started doing containers. We selected uh, Singularity, which is focused towards HPC. It has some really desirable properties for running in high-performance computing environment. Um, so the main one is that shares the same uh, PID namespace. It's just application running inside of a container. is visible outside of a container. It looks just like another process uh, running on the main OS. Um, same user inside of a container, uh, same UID as outside, which enables us to provide access to the data um, without having to do anything very complicated. Um, and um, what you can do with Singularity on our cluster is that we provide some images where we integrate our batch system, our file systems, and our environment into images we make. So we have CentOS 7 for people who need more CentOS 7 slots than are available. Uh, we also have Ubuntu image for folks that need software that only uh, behaves well on Ubuntu. <laughs> And uh, people, uh, the researchers can bring their own um, images, whether they make it themselves, download it from Singularity Hub. And another great property of Singularity is that you can import Docker images. If you, as long as the Docker image doesn't try to start System D, um, uh, it'll work great. <laughs> um, so, uh, what are so? How busy is this system? Um, so this is the utilization, uh, or the left um, uh, y-axis is the utilization. And uh, you can see that most of the time, it's somewhere between 70 and 90%, uh, which we're very happy with. A um, Couple of notable events on this. I handpicked this particular timeline because there is, was a downtime in May. Uh, system was off for, 40, uh, for 24 hours. Uh, so that's visible. And there's another event on July 9th, which is unplanned, unscheduled power incident where the whole data center powered off. 
Um, it happened at a very good time. During the day, everyone was at their stations. We were able to bring the system back in less than two hours. Um, so uh, a little bit about operations. What is it like to live with the system? Um, hosts are deployed using configuration management system that we built in-house. Why did we do it? Well, um, let's say 15 years and four Linux clusters ago when we really, really needed a configuration management system, um, Ansible, I'm not sure if it existed, but we didn't hear, didn't know about it. Uh, there were, we, we, you know, we weren't happy with the options that were available at the time. We probably would adopt something that's industry standard these days, but the features we needed is group-based configuration, so we can have a hierarchy. Uh, we want to automate the installs. We want to verify that we didn't miss an update or configuration, and we have something that does all of this for, and it's simple enough, and we don't have another FTE to convert it, so this worked well. Um, Nagios, uh, 13,000 service checks, also works well. Ganglia, it's called the monitoring system. We use it to collecting performance data. We collect about a gig, uh, gigabyte of logs, and run reports on them. I'm sorry, I'm kind of running over my time, so I'll try to speed it up. Uh, our team is four systems member, a manager, um, a, a lead, which is me, uh, two other uh, very hardworking systems administrators. We have nine scientific programmers. Uh, scientific programmers have background in uh, various disciplines in science domains, so uh, we have somebody to Hopefully, we can't quite match everyone's discipline of every researcher we have, but we have some general um, areas where we can find somebody who understands the science of what, they, uh, what the researcher is working on. A research facilitator, um, this is a person that tries to understand what the researchers need, find solutions for them, if it's something that we don't do or if it's something that we need to change. This person uh, helps people to make sure that they have some way of doing their research. Uh, accounts and resource management, uh, uh, just a team of people handling creation of accounts, management accounts, projects, allocations, um, making sure the resources are allocated fairly. Uh, it's a lot of work, actually. Uh, future, we're working on CentOS 7. Uh, we're doing open DCIM database uh, to help us track our hardware. Uh, specifically, we like to have a database of cables and know how things are cabled and how things are plugged in. Uh, we have a system for doing so now, but we're hoping that the software will do it better. Uh, we're always looking for opportunities to integrate into the cloud. If we have a researcher that wants to burst out their capability or that there's something that our system cannot do, we would like to help them to integrate what they're doing on SEC into a cloud of their choosing. So um, thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions I can answer? Just, uh, very impressive. Uh, have you ever come across a situation where you can't provide the resources asked for here? If so, what's your backup plan on that? Um, it depends. We try to find somebody else at the university or at another institution, uh, which we usually try to find a path for the person to go forward. Um, we can't, uh, money is limited, time is limited, so we can only do things within reason, but we at the very least try to recommend a path to pursue so a person could do what they set out to do. When was your current cluster deployed, and do you have any other regrets other than um, not going CentOS 7 all, all the way? Well, the uh, cluster was deployed in 2012, and that's not really, we don't regret going with CentOS 6. That was the best option at the time. Um, as far as regrets, um, I think, yeah, you know, uh, everyone, I would like to think that people using the system are happy, so we don't really need to look back and think about it. Um, uh, it's really just uh, making sure it's a uh, utilize, you know, that, that graph that shows, uh, you know, 80% utilization a lot of the time. 
that makes us happy. Um, how successful have you been at getting users to adopt Singularity? Because we haven't, but I'll see what you've got. We don't really put, uh, direct anyone towards it. I uh, would like to think that, um, that we have people that kind of just discovered it on their own and are interested in using. We, we typically try to see, you know, you know uh, our clients usually have an idea of what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, so we don't really stare it. We have uh, people who ask for software that we couldn't build. Um, some of the machine, le machine learning software has been particularly difficult. So we simply say, if you're, well, this is what you want to do, this is your option. Uh, so it's the use case that drives adoption of singularity. It's if that's a if that uh, is a fair thing to say. And the robotic simulation toolkit and a couple other pieces of software, but uh, it's really if somebody can do their work using the the main system, why change it? So you said that you're providing like almost all the software via environment modules, where the uh, this environment modules, um, well, we use that at work also, but the underlying software is just on NFS, right? And we're actually doing that too, but I'm wondering how you're actually like building the environment modules and the software to begin with. Like, are you using SPAC, or are you generating environment modules from software collections, or are you just building everything with .sas configure, make, make, install? Yeah, we have conventions of how software is built and installed and packaged. Um, our team of uh, scientific programmers um, does most of the work. So there are conventions, but configure, make, install, document it, uh, place it in a directory structure that adheres to a convention, and then use some symlinks to create the module environment um, to make it accessible and visible. Okay, thank you. I'll let you know that we are looking into using those two approaches now, generating mo uh, environment modules from soft, uh, CentOS and Red Hat software collections and SPAC, which builds everything for you up from, like, I think, libstandard C++ and glibc, I think. So this is creating a whole environment from libc onto the application? Yes, and, and the end result is module files for, like, everything. So what, uh, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, so? One, we want to be able to provide like every reasonably requested application. It may require like the very latest version of glibc. It may require the very latest version of libxml too. It may even people may even want a newer compiler because specs let you use different compilers. I think even proprietary ones like Intel's. Yeah. And and two is we have three different environments to like oh, at least three different HPC environments in our development workstation environment. We want to have the same libraries across all environments, even if they're different distros or distro releases. Okay. Um, you know, I think that singularity, uh, uh, we have done things like built-in libc, uh, and there are applications built using Intel and Portland group, group compilers. Uh, they're using different compilers. Uh, there's uh, environment modules enables you to do that, uh, and we don't really use tools to help that, although that may be a very good choice. Um, we have done things by adding uh, different libc to get application running, but uh, lately I think singularity has been an effective solution for this. Great. Okay. Thank you. We have any other questions? Well, thank you very much for that. Yep. Thank you, guys.